152. Welcome to data bite number 152, Cuidado Digital, Rep Reproductive Rights, Abortion, and Digital Networks of Care in Latin America. I'm Tuniko Nkikami, an assistant producer at Data and Society, and I'm very excited about today's event and to have you all joining us. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. We acknowledge that Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast, known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different infrastructure, a vast array of servers, humans, and computer devices spread across the planet. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic, extractive, extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplifts the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. We commit to the ongoing dismantling of all settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. Now, a first for data and society, this data bite will be held in Spanish. To access the English interpretation of the conversation, click the globe if using a computer or the three dots if using a phone and then select English. This will enable you to hear the simultaneous English interpretation of the conversation. We are very fortunate to have Claudia Alves and Valeria Lara as interpreters for the event. Now, I'm very excited to introduce Livia Garofalo, a cultural and medical anthropologist and a researcher on the health and data team at Data and Society who will introduce today's speakers and moderate the conversation. Thank you, Tunica. Gracias, Tunica. I'm going to switch to Spanish now. Um, buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Hablar en español. Bienvenides. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas a este evento. En Buenos Aires. For your participation. It's very exciting for me to be here back in uh, Argentina and now that abortion is legal now. I am very honored and pleasure to have with us the very special guest, Eugenio Ferraro and Rebecca Ramos. Eugenio Ferraro is a feminist activist, non-heterosexual, abortion accompanying person, active for eight years in the Socorro Rosa Negochea, which is a group part of Socorristas and Red, supporters in network, feminist and transfeminist who abort or also called San Red. They are part of the articulation of the national campaign for right to safe and free legal abortion. And they are part of San Red's uh, communication commission. Rebecca Ramos Duarte is a feminist lawyer by the Escuela Libre de Derecho and holds a master's degree in human rights uh, with uh, University Ibero-American. They started working at uh, JIR in January 2012. And in uh, 2015 to February 2020, she started coordinating the public and policy advocacy area. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much to Rigo and Tonika and uh, Claudia and Rebecca. It, it, we're in many parts of the world, Mexico, the United States, Argentina, Peru, well, Before leaving you with Eugenia and Rebecca, I wanted to give you a context about the purpose and the spirit of this conversation. As you all know, as we all know, we are at a moment that is very intense and very interesting also, and the fight for the uh, reproductive uh, rights in Argentina, it, abortion was legal, uh, legalized, and Mexico is on the right path right now. In the meantime, in countries like the United States, the right to abortion has been limited just recently. In Italy, my country, there is a current debate about the rights of uh, abortion. So the purpose of this conversation is to animate, to share our experience and to think about how we can move forward globally and to broaden and extend the legal right to abortion, how this right is uh, required in the streets and in the courts, and what are the tools that can be useful? And we have Eugenia and Rebecca, they can talk and share about their opinions about this. So let's think about several topics. First, the importance of language and the symbols. For instance, 
the green handkerchief, the green color, as you can see on the first slide, you have the first a cybernetic papaya, which is a, a graphic illustration done by me. But the meaning of the papaya in some medical schools is that we cannot teach to abort. So some students are using the papaya as a model of the uterus, as a symbol for the digital era in general. So we're gonna talk about the language and the importance of symbols. We're gonna talk about the digital care and how we can take care and accompany it digitally. And finally, why this, this uh, dialogue and this exchange is important when we talk about abortion, mutual support and solidarity in accompanying is important because the advance of the right globally is very strong. So we do need to get together in order to have a perspective that is global and to move forward. So that be all by me, because we want to start the discussion. I don't know if Rebecca, can you explain to us what is Jire? We can start with that. I'm gonna leave you with uh, Eugenia later to talk about her organization or their, their organization. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, JIR is a Mexican organization that this year had uh, 30 years working uh, towards the reproductive rights of people. We started as an organization dedicated to uh, communicate information based on scientific information, on legal information towards the decriminalization of abortion. And in the last decade of Jair, we extended the topics and the framework of reproductive justice in order to work not just towards the right for abortion, but also in topics regarding reproductive health, the exercise of free maternity, but also safe in which the women and people pregnant are not in risk of losing their lives. Here in Mexico, after the pandemic, we have a very worrying data supporting the, the deaths. And we have a lot of data regarding to this. And we also have data regarding the work and the care and how this intertwines in the lives and the dis reproductive decisions of all the people we work also in a framework that, is, that includes everybody. It's trans inclusive. We understand that not only the sex and gender are conditions or have situations that imply having a barrier towards getting the, the rights, but there are many other situations intertwined. They can be at the uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic topics, genetic, uh, topics. So we were, most of us are lawyers and we have four pillars, the communication, accompanying and litigation of cases, advocacy, political advocacy, social and public advocacy as well, and investigation applied also to be part of this uh, policies and frameworks. Work, Jire works in Mexico nationally and in different states. And we also have a participation at a regional level. And we also work in the, in the field in Mexico. Thank you very much. Can you talk about the uh, helpers and what you do? Thank you. Thank you everybody for the invitation and letting, I wanna tell you that the Socorristas uh, Women and Trans Feminists is an articulation of different collectives that is present in the different provinces in Argentina. Our work is giving information regarding how to abort using medication about self abortions and also after the law sanctions, we give information 
about how to uh, achieve a voluntary termination or legal termination of abortion within the health system. The way, the political way of how to accompany abortions is respecting the lives of women and other people with the capacity to have an abortion. We give quick responses and correct based on the context of that person that needs to have an abortion. We do this thinking or taking in consideration their experience and their needs. And we respect fundamentally their decisions, recognizing their autonomy and the strengths of each person regarding their decision to abort. We also like to say that we dispute the colonistic uh, hege he hegemonist uh, health for us. Regarding the knowledge about the medications, but also accompanying for uh, help and for feminists. In terms of the political mindset, our our horizon is the total decriminalization of abortion. That's why we uh, fight towards free abortions. But in the meantime, we do need legal abortions without any causal, without any limit in terms of uh, time, weeks. So that's why we request the uh, Argentinian government and other governments to stop their attempts regarding the, the persecution of accompanying people and, and people that have the capability to have an abortion. And also, we are also part, active part of the Compañera Network, which is a network within Latin America and the Caribbean. We're also gonna talk about how we can uh, create networks regarding abortions for us we have men, trans people, building networks throughout the Compañera network allows us to extend the limits and the possibilities of thinking given a context in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think it's very interesting because you, it was mentioned, both of you, words, how words are so important. There is a difference between free and legal. Rebecca, maybe you can help us to understand how, what, what does uh, decriminalization mean? What is the, diff the difference between these words, but also about the symbols and how we can get to that decriminalization at a legal level. Why Mexico and Argentina and the entire uh, region of Latin America, they have different, they are in different uh, moments in this path. I don't know if Rebecca and Eugenia later can answer to that question. Yes, I think at a regional level in terms of how we are, where we are and the different strategies that we use, the different paths that we've used in different contexts in, in different countries that we have in Mexico, for instance, we have a federalism that we celebrate when one country, this is de uh, decriminalized, but it's not decriminalized in the entire country as it happened in Argentina last year. On one hand, the de decriminalization refers to re remove abortion from the criminal codes. And as Eugenia said, from JIA here in Mexico, from different organizations and collectives, our North is the total decriminalization of the abortion without any question and to remove it from the uh, legal codes. Uh, in Mexico, it is for the first trimester that is decriminalized. But on the other hand, regarding the legality of abortion has to do with the changes in the medical in the health legislation and also in the public, uh, public health uh, legislation so it can be offered uh, freely for free for to all people with the capacity to have an abortion but I think what Eugenia mentions in terms of talking about liberty it has to do not just 
to have this re recognized in the legal framework, but I'm speaking on behalf of Mexico, but for us to have a free abortion, to have the economic, social, and political questions to uh, allow these abortions on the public health, uh, at the public health level, but also in our own homes with our friends. So there are different degrees. Of course, we have to keep moving forward to generate strategies to achieve the total decriminalization, but also to have a warranty of conditions for us, the people that have the capacity to have an abortion to have, to, to be able to make the decision based on our needs and based on our wishes in terms of abortion. So right now in the region, we uh, see this, what's happening in Mexico, what happened in Colombia a few months ago about the sentence uh, that decriminalizes abortion for the 24 week period. And also what happens in Argentina, um, Central America in countries like Haiti and Honduras that they don't have the conditions. So they're fighting towards the causal uh, models because the, the political and legal context doesn't allow them to advance. But in general terms, our objective is to remove this from the legal code to guarantee the access and to improve the conditions for uh, the, per the person that needs the service. <laughs> She's asking to speak a little bit slower for us interpreters. It's a bit difficult, Eugenia. It, it's a great perspective, thank you. The value of the decriminalization, I don't know if Eugenia has a, an answer about this. I wanted to add, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I'm not gonna ask, for excuses about something that Rebecca said, because we share opinions. I want to add that on the path towards legalization, also in Argentina, we had a paradigm, paradigm to reducing the damages and risk, and then in legal interruption of the uh, of pregnancy with due to uh, causal, uh, to different causes like uh, rape, and psychosocial causes. And we also won the legality. And that to that legality, we wouldn't have reached that legality without building up to a, de uh, a social decriminalization. So that social decriminalization is reached when we say abortion, sometimes out loud and in different uh, spaces. When abortion stops being a practice linked to uh, gore movies and uh, regard uh, linked to uh, scandal and blood, then abortion stops uh, starts being understood as a sexual practice, uh, uh, one more sexual practice, a practice that. It, is decriminalized socially based on the dialogue, based on creating a soup opera, uh, uh, creating a movie to build our activism from experiences that use uh, abortions. We have to start understanding that it is it is necessary that the government guarantees the uh, conditions. We know we want that to be legal, and on that path, while we keep building up towards a social decriminalization that allows us to see to everybody, to teachers, to uh, doctors, to the administrative uh, health uh, people. Not, to see abortion not just as a health issue, but as an autonomy topic to apply our rights. I agree with Eugenia. That is fundamental in terms of the social decriminalization. Here in Mexico, we 
achieve the decriminalization and legalization of abortion in the first trimester in Mexico City in 2017. And we had to wait two years for another state of the Republic to decriminalize this, the state of Oaxaca. So at that moment, the green uh, wave was already existed. We already had the green handkerchief as a symbol of legal abortion. And in terms of the timeline, we see a, a lack or a gap. We had a 12 year term. And then two years later, we had uh, more states that added a sentence of a, a Mexican tribunal that regarded that the uh, legalization of abortion illegalization of abortion was uh, unconstitutional. And we got the support of different uh, departments. So I think this element of social decriminalization is fundamental in terms uh, of uh, advancing the public agenda. So in our case, that had a very favorable, favorable uh, advancement towards the decriminalization. So for me, the uh, topic and the actions in terms of the narrative and in so the topic of social decriminalization, like Eugenia said, it's fundamental to me. We also have institutional uh, paths that the dialogue and on the streets uh, uh, with uh, families, with friends, on uh, social media that has have an impact, a positive impact in this, what we call in Mexico, we see this huge difference in terms of what happened 15 years ago and in terms of what's going on right now. I wanted to move on towards uh, networks, the importance of networks. Eugenia, you call, you call yourself socorristas in red supporters in uh, network. What is the importance of digital networks for the transformation towards solidary uh, networks and activism networks in order to keep working towards the uh, social decriminalization of abortion? There's a double meaning. Uh, 10 years ago, we've been socorristas in redes. It starts as a network to support the abortion rights. In the meantime, we would have a accompanying device. We didn't even think about feminist accompanying networks. We had other needs. We wanted to create an accompanying device. And then on that path, we discovered that the network has a power in terms of cared abortions and feminist abortions. So it is they're possible because we accompany people and because uh, as uh, people that accompany people on abortions, we are also accompanied in our labor. We are supported by a network that is very strong uh, in terms of activism, not just in street activism, but also in networks or so in social media. At that moment, when we, when Socorristas in Red this was born, we had a blog. Let's think about uh, that at the time we had a blog and then it turned into a website. And then we moved on to social networks and a more uh, digital uh, activism. And that activism was very needed, very important in 2018. Before 2018, we thought, we were talking with some uh, people how in February 2018, we were surprised for who, for us that were on the abortion discussion, the activism in 2018 previous to this discussion. So this helped the discussion that it occurred later. So the green wave came even uh, higher than the activism. So the support of digital networks was uh, important for this. And it was important to support this 
uh, difference between uh, accompanying and visibility. And I'm talking about the Argentina context in 2014. I'm not saying that that I'm not saying that we should move that discussion for the context of Honduras. But in Argentina, it was possible to taking care ourselves the more visible we became. Before 2018, those who are teachers and or that we teach in networks so that people like us that we go uh, to accompany people and we have two phones, one a personal phone and one for accompanying during abortions. So I had an abortion phone. It has to be outside my home. And I used a different name. I used my grandmother's name as an accompanying person. So there was a, a self-care or self-protection thing going on. So the discussion was very long in terms of if caring for ourselves was being inside the uh, abortion closet or outside the abortion closet. So it started becoming more easy when we started saying out loud, hello, this is Eugenia. I am an accompanying person during abortion. So it was less weird that I, as a teacher, would have a two um, a phone. So it was less weird. And I mentioned this phone and anecdote because it was important in terms of the decision-making process regarding visibility in networks, in uh, media, the, in the media. We were basically in the clandestinity, the pedagogic clandestinity in a way. And to intertwine uh, in networks with other organizations also allowed that allowed us that if somebody was uh, hurt, everybody was hurt. So that we understood uh, as uh, taking care of each other and self uh, care. That is very interesting about what were you saying about phones because in the United States after the Supreme Court decision back in March, there were a lot of uh, conversations about the digital security and safety. So many of the conversations were focused on that. So I don't know if that, I wanted to see that the digital aspect is dangerous, but it's also a very important, a very powerful force. I don't know if you, Rebecca, wanted to mention what is going on regarding this topic and what is the, what's going on in terms of digital networks. I think that Besides what Eugenia mentioned in terms of these cares and the accompanying networks here in Mexico, that it was developed a lot in terms of the discussions, in terms of the uh, public uh, safety. We had to see how the information flowed in social networks in terms also on how to abort, what is needed, what signals we need to be uh, careful about, the dosage, the medication. So that part was very interesting. And now that I heard Eugenia in terms of that strategy, what they were doing as accompanying people while the network, that, that while the decriminalization was being achieved. For me, it's very interesting how from the collectives and the accompanying people, yes, indeed, we have the state and we have the state, the penal code, but factically speaking, in the rea in reality, that we have the possibility to abort. I was thinking about that important case that happened in Mexico back in 20, in the year 2000, a very young person, 13 year old girl that was raped, she was pregnant, Paulina, and she, the abortion was uh, denied for her, even though it was legal and how she couldn't have an abortion. The pregnancy had to go on against her will. And how in the last years that hasn't been the reality that we couldn't change despite we have organizations like Jai or another organization that we accompanied Polina at the time, simply because we, didn't have the access towards information and abortion medication. And we, because we also had legal frameworks like in Mexico, the one in Mexico City. So this revolution that has been having the information that has 
it means uh, having the right medication and having the right people that know and that accompany people from the standpoint of empathy in order in order to understand having uh, the reasons of the legal framework or people that don't want to access the legal the existing legal uh, devices so that to me has been it was being hand in hand and the information that we have in uh, social networks. I wanted to also add that in the case of Mexico and the social mobilization that we had, networks have been, uh, social networks have been super important because people had to be at, in their homes during the pandemic in March a, a, the 8th, we had a, a a protest uh, scheduled, but everybody had to remain at their homes because of the pandemic. So we use social networks to keep the spirit alive. And we re continue the conversation regarding abortion and we kept the conversation going on in the digital networks. So that part I think is fundamental in terms of access, more democratic, for information, for information, the communication to interconnect with other people, basically in the abortions. The other side to the work of Jairus and the rescuers is an, is a data automation. Because when there's a lot of clandestinity, we don't know exactly how many abortions are going through in the country. So could you tell us a bit more about the importance of collecting data, how you do it, the relevance of the digital world for this? I don't know who wants to start. I'll start. The at least in the in the case of red de socorristas automation was used when we saw that the figures for non legal abortion was just a supposition because we assumed that per each birth there was an abortion and a health which is an international figure. It's not something Argentina came up with. So we did an estimate and then the rate was huge. We thought that Argentina had between 300,000 and 500,000 abortions per year, but that couldn't be proved. It was just an estimate. So that's how we started automating. I'm looking down here because I have my notes here. Also for accompaniment, because with phone accompaniment, I remember I wrote everything down. I had an accompaniment diary. Rebecca mentioned it. We had a pills technology because revolution includes pharmacological revolution that allows abortions. So we wrote everything down, what medication they were using, how often they were taking it, everything. If the patient vomited, everything. Obviously, it's impossible to have all that in just one notebook because you didn't have just one person. You had four people per week, so no notebooks were enough. Visibility did this too. When we had two people to accompany, of course it was okay, but the more we talked to students and more we told them, hey, I'm Eugenia, I can accompany you through your abortion, the more people we got. That's when we came up with a protocol, which includes a bunch of questions in the in-person and digital workshop when the pandemic came, because we didn't stop working all throughout the pandemic, even though we were locked down. 
we did this protocol with data, not only about the identity, but also about who are those people that are aborting, what's their socioeconomic status, what's their gender, what's their education level, what's their gynecological background. And in that way, we know that over 70% of the person we accompanied last year, and you can find all this data in our website, by the way, I don't want to go into detail, but this automation that we do every year helped us see that over 70% of the people we accompany are under the line of poverty of Argentina. And it, we also know now that we don't accompany people living in the cities. We accompany mostly people living in the cities, very few people from the rural sector. Now, with that data, we can generate political incidents. It's critical for that, for the decisions made in the Congress. But we can also refine, we can perfection what we do. And now we know that people know about us through the social media, they know us more through social networks than through the website. So automation makes each abortion process more significant for everyone. I think Kiria does that too. They have a website, so we're gonna share it. Actually, we were born for that. Our name includes the concept of information. Our work all throughout 30 years has been automatic, basically. Now that I just heard Eugenia, I agree with her because in order to have incidents to achieve the reforms that we need to decriminalize, to legalize, we need it. But also when it comes to improving the processes, both within the organization, especially when it comes to accompaniment and legal procedures. There's something we've seen specifically in Mexico City. When someone asks for information, in 2007, when the ILE program started, we started going to public sources to know which women were aborting, what was their age, how many kids they had, their education level, whether they used uh, contraception methods, et cetera. So we, that way we managed to have a state that wasn't just reacting, but also acting. So they were publishing that information in their websites and collecting the data. Until now, we know that in the last 15 years, around 250,000 abortions have been carried out in Mexico City with the ILE program in Mexico City. So that of course was transferred to other states where we promoted abortion. And it has helped us counterweight some arguments, for example, the health system telling, that, telling us that they don't have enough resources to provide free abortion we were able to prove through data that it wasn't costly, that it can be done in, they don't have, the patient doesn't have to stay in the hospital, that there are several techniques that can be used, but it's all data that we automated and it has helped us be more efficient with incidence processes on politics. In GIR, we generate wider reports, very detailed reports. We create flyers, we write memorandums that we give to legislators. So it has definitely impacted all that, but I also want to highlight what Eugenia said because it perfects our work. 
when we see the data that has been automated, when we see all the information about the legal support that we provided in abortions, it helps us automate, but also give a better shape to the lawsuits that we bring to the court. And it also helps us identify the weaker points, what needs to be strengthened in the work and share all that with other organizations, both national and collectives. For example, right now we are working hand in hand with state organizations. We are using legal, uh, legal resources. Sometimes they deny abortions. So we share these lawsuit forms where the patient only has to fill some data the form is already there for them to bring it to the court and file it immediately. So I think that automatic information is critical. Maybe at the beginning, we think that it will take our time, we need resources for it, but without a doubt, it's an investment because it helps us improve the work we do inside the organization and it helps us leverage the modifications because having the arguments ready, having the information already automated for you to go to the decision makers, it makes a whole difference. Can I just add something? I'll add something before, if you want. Uh, if you have questions, you have the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. I was saying um, automation for us changed because abortion was legalized and it changed through trans-feminist discussions. So the first great question for automation is, how does a person perceive themselves? And then we have a section referring to whether people know they can go to the health system for an abortion. And if they have already gone to the public system before going to the socorristas, what was the response of the health system? The, the, the response, the action that socorristas do to, to provide the support takes into account all this because depending on what we observe is how we respond. And it all depends on whether there is a guaranteed abortion in Argentina. We're gonna wait for some questions, please ask away. I don't know if we're going to move on to the next topic maybe, which is what are the current challenges for the movement? I know there are a lot, but which, which ones are they? What are we missing? And I'm, I'm guessing that Carrying out this kind of work implies risks. I'm sure that as activists, you've gone through stuff because the opposition is really strong. So what are we missing? What do you think are the challenges for the movement? And it's also important to mention that the green wave comes from the South. That's very important to highlight and whatever perspective you can provide. Challenges. In the case of Mexico, we have a very small region inside a country. States that have decriminalized it, states that are providing the services, states that do not provide the services and criminalize it unless it's uh, for uh, cases of violation, of, of violation and other states that, in spite of what the criminal code says, pursue women that ask for obstetric procedures. We still see criminalization against people that had obstetric emergencies. So 
Mexico has a lot of open doors. We keep promoting legislation modifications to decriminalize abortion. We have to strengthen the states where it has already been legalized as part of the public services. And as per the entire country, we have to keep working. We have to keep being visible in the social networks with collectives, with organizations, with those who have medical services, those who have legal services, so that we can precisely guarantee the access to safe abortions outside the public institutions, the ones managed by the state. And there's another thing that we are still seeing, in at least in Mexico, but I guess we can also see it in other parts of the world. And it has to do with the different positions, different lines of feminism, the ones that are inclusive, the ones that are exclusive, because we are facing anti-rights speeches both within and outside feminism. So I think that we have to speak about that after the order of the Supreme Court that includes women and people giving birth, we've seen people point in the court because they say that they erase women, they erase the political figure of women. So we have to face the challenges that are we live within the feminist movement. It has to do with sex work, pornography, different positions. We keep being on opposite sides. I do think though that within the legal reproductive framework when it comes to the exercise of rights and to autonomy, we need to have a commitment to the acknowledgement of the other person because we need to acknowledge how they identify themselves, how they go through life, how, uh, how we can accompany the abortion process so it is the most uh, positive one, always attending to their needs. So in the case of Mexico, we see all that, but there's something that actually gives us a lot of strength, something that is going on regionally, what happened in Argentina almost a year ago, what happened a couple of months ago in Colombia. Of course, for us in Mexico, that gives us strength, inspires us, pushes us to keep moving forward with all these processes, and it helps us face the challenges. I think everything, I think what you just said is very important about exclusive and inclusive feminism. I do think that's a global challenge. It's a conversation that we're having in the US and also how the right wing uses this. We're always trying to find a balance so that we can have conversations on that. I know that in your case, Eugenia, your name includes feminist and trans feminist. So maybe you have something to say about that. It's an open debate. Naming ourselves, I mean, we have already talked about the relevance of words, but in our last plenary session, which is the annual meeting we have in the organization, we decide always to call ourselves feminists and trans feminists. And it wasn't a simple debate, it wasn't a debate where we didn't have to rethink everything, which is something that happens often in feminism and trans feminism. They always make us question ourselves. We say that there's not one feminist movement, but feminisms. At that moment, we include other debates. And the debate about trans exclusiveness or about turf, non feminism that are supposed to be wide and academic, are a debate that has been going on in Argentina for a while. We have popular feminism, 
feminisms that come from territorial neighborhood organizations, social organizations that are mostly working in the territory. And there they think about feminisms that are outside the academic debate, outside the universities. And that has fed other feminisms. In the abortion debates in Argentina, wouldn't have been the same if our trans colleagues hadn't been part of it. And I defend them and I want to take a moment to defend them, to call them, because without a doubt, they taught us that the debate was way wider than just abortion. They taught us that it was a debate about freedom, about autonomy, not about a medical or non-medical procedure to interrupt a non-feasible pregnancy. Dealing with freedom and autonomy in the abortion debate wouldn't have been possible without those daring people that made us go to the street. So we understand that the main challenge is to approach ourselves always through a wider perspective without just looking at ourselves. And I insist in Argentina, almost two years after the, the law was passed, some territories have seen actually a setback with this law. Now that we have a law, let others take care of it. Now that we have a law, there are cities like the one where I am, a city outside Buenos Aires, which is not the north side to Argentina, which is not a lost town in Argentina, where we only guarantee abortion in one place and we guarantee it deficiently, which is even worse than when we didn't have a law. So without a doubt, challenges are the full implementation of the rights we have acquired, sexual, reproductive, and non-reproductive rights. And of course, the health of trans people. The abortions of trans people are important. So calling ourselves trans feminists helps us see how we can adapt our accompaniment to other people that have the capacity to give birth. There's a question, I think, because our audience seems to be very shy, but we have a question and then we're gonna start closing. The question is, what can places like the United States learn from places like Argentina and Mexico using networks and digital tools to care for people. And I think they do exist in the US, but maybe we can wrap up with that. And if you, if Rebecca wants to ask something to Eugenia and the other way around, please do, so we can wrap up. I'm going to start trying to answer the question, otherwise I get anxious. So I'm gonna try to answer with what I understand from English. We can't see people face to face. I do want to defend that, having face to face encounters to provide information. Our Rescue in activity is actually crossed by the line of more information for lesbians and feminists. It's a telephone line, a handbook that has already existed for us. 
and a telephone line where you can call to have information. That's a very specific possibility for a determined moment for certain conditions. Always thinking about the territorial conditions in a specific time and specific geographical place. Face-to-face -face encounters, seeing the people, the person face-to-face, -face, being able to tell them, hey, what's your name? What are you afraid of? Without a doubt, will change the quality of abortion. Group workshops also do. Many people who go through abortions can meet each other with these workshops. People from different ages, from different social and economic backgrounds, and that's how they can share their experiences. For me, as a socorrista, defending those, promoting those face-to-face -face encounters doesn't mean that we are going to leave aside the digital value when it comes to providing information. And actually, We've been providing information about other places where visibility is not possible at all because we should see how smart feminist engineering is. Feminist engineering that lets us provide information in places where we can't provide information otherwise. I'm thinking about places like the Caribbean. I think that there we need a network that would have bring work from other latitudes so that people who live in restrictive conditions can have access to abortion, free, safe abortion. When it comes to the, to the Mexican experience, we have some some things similar to the US, we are starting to work with state authorities, state congresses, not only nationally, because without a doubt, we're not leaving that aside. But I think that that part of the experience works. And something that is critical, that or something that Eugenia has already mentioned is, paying attention to the context. We have criminalization cases in Mexico. So for us as organizations, as movements who have legal, but also public pressure resources can st stop those attempts to process people who awarded, uh, the people who provided the service. And it doesn't mean that it's going to happen in all US. I'm thinking about counties or states that are very conservative, where you also have a very strict, stringent processes, criminal processes. So definitely social pressure is not enough there. Also because of all the polarization that is going on. So I think that for us in Mexico, we are also excited about being able to share with the US collectives and organizations what we've done. But all these strategies don't necessarily apply to them because we have criminalization risks, criminalization for Latina women, for Afro women, they've been already criminalized in other contexts. So abortion can definitely mean another risk for them. We can share experiences, but the situation the people who are in the field are going to define the procedure because they are the ones who know about the risks and opportunities that can come up. Okay, so we're going to wrap up because time is over. So first of all, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Eugenia. Thank you, Claudia and Valeria, Rigo, Tunica, and and um, 
Anya, and we're going to share this video about the huge success in Argentina's streets when abortion was legalized, so you can see what was achieved there. Thank you very much. Bien. Resulta aprobado. 38, con 38 votos afirmativos, 29 negativos y una abstención, resulta aprobado. Se convierte en ley y se gira al Poder Ejecutivo. Bueno, seremos así y muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Ha sido un gusto, un placer. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation. Hugs for everyone. Bye.